I'm just slowly letting everybody in. Uh, a couple more people. So I'm going to, um, I've started recording again. If you don't want to show up in the recording, please turn, turn your cameras off. I'm going to hand it over to Christian and stop sharing. Christian, please feel free to introduce yourself. Okay. Maybe I should turn my camera off. I don't want my face on this thing. No, it's okay. Uh, what's going on, everybody? My name is not Natasha Pello. <laughs> I just noticed my wife's name is on there. Uh, this is her iPad. Anyways, my name is Christian Melendez. Uh, I'm a farmer. I've been doing it maybe 15 years or so. I currently farm up uh, near Columbia, Maryland on a farm called Mary's Land Farm. Uh, I'd love to give any of you a tour if you're interested. We run the gambit of animals and orchards and vegetables and a native plant nursery. Um, summer camp is going on right now. So, you know, Farmer Christian is, is with the kitties all day. Uh, we have festivals, sunflower festivals, things like that. So anyways, my background is primarily in uh, vegetable production. I did that about 10 years or so. Then I've been working more and more with orchards and cut flowers um, and native plants for the last five or six years. Um, and now I, I was just telling Patricia, our vegetable farmer just moved on. So now I'm doing everything again. Uh, but I've, I've also worked with some local urban farming companies like Compost Cab. Um, I've done a lot of like large scale composting in Maryland. Uh, I've worked with Loving Carrots and other, and other landscaping companies. So kind of all over the place um, the last decade and a half. And um, I hope tonight, you know, you get a lot out of this class. This is the first time we're doing it. So hopefully it's not too rocky. And uh, I'm happy to answer as many questions as we can. There's kind of a lot to go through, but uh, we can make time for, you know, discussion if we want. Uh, I think Patricia is going to probably moderate uh, all of that. This is my first time doing a class on Zoom. Uh, I'm rarely in front of a screen, so I'm sorry if uh, my demeanor is not as smooth as some of you all, I'm sure, are very much uh, well-versed in Zoom, the Zoom world. Uh, so that I can... Just, that just means you're a real farmer, Christian. That's what we want okay. to see. You have the so real... I'm not playing Facebook with Farmville. Uh, Uh, so Christian, can you see your slides up? I can, yeah. Uh, so feel free to start and just let me know when to um, click them over. Okay, cool, cool. I guess, yeah, we can click over. Um, okay, so yeah, the, the class, you know, is about this urban oasis and that can actually mean lots of things, right? Um, it's gonna mostly be a, plant, a class about native plants. I think that was, the main objective and and you know how your garden can kind of be um, a sanctuary uh, for the local ecology um, but you know the urban oasis can mean lots of things so in these pictures you know some little inspiration about um, making a space that is pleasing to you maybe none of these pictures are actually something that's pleasing to you but uh you know your your little piece of land or even your balcony or porch you know, should serve the purpose of, you know, yes, promoting, you know, better habitat and wildlife, but it should be a place that you enjoy too. Yeah, you can go on, Patricia. Uh, and, you know, I just said habitat. So that's kind of like an obvious one. And how, yeah, that's good. The next slide, you know, there's a lot of programs in DC. I remember the River Smart program at Love and Carrots, you know, they, we would be a authorized contractor to put in rain gardens and bayscaping and, you know, baywise gardening and there's all these terms, but the point is, you know, how can we each contribute to improving the way the city has been set up and, and in general, the suburbs and how that affects Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, so as you can see here, you know, some pictures about how intense it can be with the way things are managed or not managed in the city when it comes to stormwater 
and erosion and what you know simple rain garden i think this is a rain garden from near where i live here in montgomery county silver spring um so we we can move on okay so uh, a little bit of you know the non-sexy part with with this uh class is site assessment uh before we start talking about plants and seeds and all that stuff so some of this is probably pretty elementary for some of you all if you've been gardeners or farmers, growers, whatever, for a long time. Uh, but I always encourage people to do a soil test. We're talking about native plants, some of which are edible um, and medicinal. Um, and if you're going to use the plants in that way, then I would definitely encourage you not only to get a sense of what your um, soil structure and organic matter content is like and, and nutrient content, but also, especially in the city, in DC, you know, getting like a heavy metals test and really understanding is your soil, you know, laden with things that if you start ingesting might be causing you problems later on. Um, so that's basic soil testing. Uh, you know, you can, sorry, for sure, you can go back. Uh, the sun, so again, pretty basic. Uh, and if you're at your balcony or your backyard, you know, long enough, you have a good sense of where those little pockets of sunlight are. But it's important because some of these plants, you know, they may say on the plant tag or seed packet, like full sun. But maybe actually when you get to know that plant a little better, it's like really nice to have morning sun. But especially when the summer heat sets in, uh, some afternoon shade would really help out a lot. So, you know, you want to get a sense, and not just in the summer, year round, um, depending on what buildings and trees are around, if they're evergreen or deciduous, how the lighting can change, how the shade can change on your site. And also, you know, in the city, there's a lot of heat sinks. It could be brick walls, it could be asphalt, concrete, um, what, however, you know, your space is set up, it's good to understand, you know, that on a really tiny piece of property, you may have dramatically different microclimates. And a lot of that might just have to do with the way um, things are structured around. So it's good to get a sense of that. And that's something you can just kind of feel as you walk around the property throughout the day. Um, water, understanding, you know, does uh, some of your spaces get inund inundated really badly with water? Maybe most of the year it's pretty dry, but then when a heavy rain does come, um, it doesn't deal with the, the water very well. And you have a pond in your backyard or the opposite. And also, you know, how does it flow through your space? Um, because, you know, you're also uh, victim to what's happening next door to you, whether it's like city property or your neighbors. And, you know, someone, someone I landscape for, their neighbor just pulled out a big stand of bamboo. Everyone's happy, you know, let's get rid of the bamboo. Now there's a ton of water that was being pulled up by the bamboo all year round. And now there's just tons of water sitting around uh, two or three days after a big rain. So really understanding the flow of water in your property will help, especially, you know, if you put down, you know, all this nice mulch, and you have fresh plants in the ground and they're gonna be years away from being fully established and with an extensive root system. And then a rain comes and you put it right in the line of fire. A lot of those, uh, that mulch and that soil will just erode away and it would be a big mess. Um, so understanding you know, how water interacts on your site is important. Um, and, and so I didn't, I wrote site assessment, not site, prep either. I should have wrote prep because if you're in a site where the weeds are really bad, um, you know, every time you plant something, they just get gobbled up. Late May to mid-July is, you know, peak growth. 
and sometimes it feels like you can never stay on top of the weeds. Um, a lot of people, as you can see in this picture, will just, uh, well, this is using a tarp to just basically kill everything off. Um, sometimes a week is all that's needed. Sometimes a month, two months, people will tarp for, but that will, you know, like it says, be a reset button and give you a chance. As a vegetable grower, um, whenever I've used new pieces of land and just st studying around, you know, the farm, the makeup of the weeds on the site, sometimes we don't even bother um, to do anything except, you know, lay down a tarp because the thistle or the Bermuda grass or the morning glory is just gonna be so bad um, that we really need a heads, uh, you know, to get ahead of it from the start. If you don't wanna use plastic or you don't have a tarp or you actually wanna build soil while you're trying to um, reestablish what's going on there, then sheet mulching is really popular. And I love sheet mulching and we try to do it as much as we can, but it's gonna be a lot more labor intensive um, and, and all that really means is using something that is biodegradable in place of a tarp. So oftentimes that's newspaper, a thick layer of newspaper um, or cardboard. I've seen other things, but those are probably the two most popular. And so putting that down to smother out things for you know a few weeks at least, sometimes it can last if you put enough for a few months. And, and people get really into it. There's, you know, you can look up online, uh, ultimate bomb proof sheet mulch. There's like a famous permaculture book from years ago. And this guy has a, a wild diagram of basically lasagna style layering leaves and grass clippings and manure and amendments and like wood chips and this and that. And, you know, the idea is by the end of the year or so, that it takes to break down, you've really built up some nice soil um, in place of just buying compost and dumping it there. Um, as it's decomposed, you know, it's, it's killed off a lot of weeds. You've established a new layer of, of topsoil. Well, that's not really soil, it's organic matter, but uh, that's a little in the weeds. It's gonna be weed free. So, um, because you're just growing on top, you've probably, you know, I get a lot of people come to the farm and, and they always want to tell me about their new YouTube gardening sensation celebrity. Now, you know, no till or one till or no dig or there's a million methodologies, bioextensive, biointensive, biodynamic, but, you know, not digging into the ground, if you can help it, sometimes you, it's advised to do it, but I avoid it if I can, because you're destroying what structure is in there um and whatever you know microorganisms and, and worms you have but you're also like reawakening thousands if not more um weed seeds that are in there so you can save yourself a lot of hassle by just building on top so anyways i, I think i kind of went on a tangent with all that but we can move on so this is a picture um from the area where someone put in a new native garden planting and uh, you know it looks cool because they put their labels labels is really important <laughs> because if you're still learning at some point you're gonna be like what what is growing in here uh, when things are finally thriving but uh, the point of this slide is that it takes time for perennials in general we're talking about native plants but perennials in general to really take off um, so there's this popular saying, you know, at first they're sleeping and then creeping and then they, you know, they bounce out and, you know, you can see that all over the place when you see, you know, new gardens or rain gardens being put in and, and that's controversial because you're like, it looks so ugly and what do they do and, you know, what are these sticks and if you don't maintain it either, it nothing ever actually happens. I've seen a lot of um, incomplete projects because no one's staying on top of it. Uh, and the weeds, you know, gladly come through this really nice garden bed that you've built. So 
you have to, you know, it's a lesson in patience and investment and commitment. Uh, and I've, I've landscaped for a lot of people. I still do on the side. And every year, I, it's really exciting to go to some of these gardens where they've been gung-ho about natives and it looked like nothing. It looked kind of like a joke the first year, two years. And now it's a jungle and it's beautiful and lush and they do very little to it um, besides maybe pruning or, you know. But anyway, that, we'll talk later about maintenance and uh, post-planting. And this thrillers and fillers and spillers comes from um, when I used to teach container gardening and flower gardening classes. That's a common design technique where, you know, yeah, we want to put native plants in the ground, probably want to put a little bit of everything. But going back to the, one of the goals of the class is that it should be, you know, aesthetically pleasing to you and, um, you know, your own personal sanctuary besides for the wildlife. So you know, think about how you want it to look. And a lot of the plants I'll put in these slides, you know, some are great at, you know, they might, it might, there might be fire pink, which is um, a certain plant that's really tiny and insignificant looking, but when it blooms, I mean, you cannot stare at it. Um, so that might be more of a thriller, um, or you might use grasses or ferns or some other um, very subtle flowering um, native plants to just fill out the area, and provide you some background to contrast the more, you know, uh, attractive looking thrillers. And, and spillers gets more into like, you know, creeping and crawling and binding things. So that's just something, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it in the class, but something while, you know, you are designing to keep in mind as you decide to, you know, pick out plants because you have lots of plants to choose from, okay. Um, so we're going to talk about native plants. We've already said that, but I'm going to also, you know, spend some time talking about non-native plants. Um, and, you know, some people are, you know, 100% native and that's cool. And I totally appreciate that. As someone who grows vegetables, I can't say that <laughs> I'll ever just grow native plants. Uh, but we'll talk about, you know, edible native plants, fruiting plants, things that could be, you know, vegetables and herbs. Um, but, you know, why, why do we want to focus a little bit on native plants? There's lots of reasons. And I'm sure a lot of you already know these reasons. But, you know, basically, native plants have been here long enough to develop relationships with uh, insects and birds and mammals and other things like that, but also the soil. A lot of does not get talked about underground, what you can see, um, and how, you know, the soil is being improved and how that supports the ecology. I mean, there's more people studying fungi and bacteria. Um, usually we talk about, you know, certain caterpillars and moths and things like that. But yeah, these native plants tend to uh, support way more species of micro and macro flora and fauna than uh, uh, fauna than uh, something like uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of you know maybe a, a non-native mint that and mint on the farm and and dill and, and carrots that flower. They attract tons of stuff. I use it a lot for pest control with vegetables. Um, and it's great, but you can get oftentimes even more. And, and there's lots of scientists out there that are working on documenting this stuff. Some people take it to the extreme and, and ignore that there's a lot of data to show that, you know, non-native things have, you know, be, uh, species of insects and wildlife have adapted to, you know, use them for support. But the point is more natives, doesn't hurt. Uh, and even people that write great books about natives will say, you know, we just want to increase the percentage of them in the environment um, as much as we can. So we're going to start with native plants. 
we have a um, few slides about like small trees and shrubs. Since we're talking about DC and, and the general DMV, if you want to start planting much larger trees like a white oak, that's cool. And, and you can find plenty of information online. But I imagine most people don't want to plant a tree that's going to get 50 feet wide and as tall, if not taller. Um, so we've got a few here. Uh, I'll say a few words. There's a lot to look at. I'm just kind of giving you a like a cheat sheet, uh, cliff notes of really popular ones, um, easy ones, and ones that probably are more and more easy to find at a nursery. Not all the plants on here are going to be so easy to find, but I, these are really popular ones that more and more nurseries are catching on to. So, you know, you've got American holly, you know, that, that tree's all over the place. Um, there's just some basic info on these slides about, you know, what size they're gonna be, what kind of conditions they like. We're talking about small trees and shrubs. So for the most part, they generally want full to partial sun. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, people always ask, well, what can I do for the shade? But as we get into like smaller plants, we'll talk more about that. So I didn't really write anything about sunlight on, on these slides. Um, but American holly, I mean, that, that serves many purposes year round because obviously the berries are edible for a lot of local wildlife. Um, it's an evergreen. Um, it really helps prevent erosion and stabilizes sites. Uh, if you've, ever stared at an American holly in like, I guess May, early June, the one in my backyard was flowering. That the slot, the picture right next to the red berries is a flower from an American holly. And if you just look up at this thing when it's flowering, the blooms don't really catch your eye so much, but there are so many different insects buzzing around. It provides a ton of great, um, food for wildlife. There's lots of benefits. I won't, you know, bore you. This is like one plant on a presentation where we have a few dozen plants. Uh, but that's, you know, that's an easy one to find. It's very low maintenance and popular. Persimmon. So, you know, people want to see what they can eat out of the garden. Um, so persimmon is really popular. There used to be a lot more uh, native persimmon groves all over the place. There's less and less. Um, it's an amazing fruit. It's really small. It might be the size of a golf ball when we're talking about um, the native one. And you have to eat that the day it's ripe um, to enjoy it. Otherwise, it'll just pull all the moisture out of your mouth. There's, there's a lot of tannins in it. And it's very astringent if you eat it when it's not ripe, which is one reason why it's not as uh, widespread. It doesn't, you know, when we're talking about like industrial agriculture and where you can get the supermarket, this fruit does not travel very well. Uh, when it's ready, it looks kind of gross. It looks like it's rotting already. Um, so people, and, and half of the fruit is seed. So you really kind of want it, but it's one of the most incredible flavors you'll ever have. And what people are doing instead is if you start seeking out, you know, persimmons, a lot of nursery growers will graft um, Asian varieties from Russia and China and, and all sorts of other countries on the other side of the planet onto an American persimmon. That's really common with orchards in general is grafting, which basically you're taking um, what they call the sign. You're taking what you want to eat. So it could be, um, I don't know, a wase fuyu uh, Asian persimmon. It's going to be much bigger, much less seed. It's not going to, you know, have a one day window to eat and enjoy and can, and can store and ship really well. And you put that, you, you graft it, you merge, you know, these two pieces of plant material to the native one. So you get the benefits, the vigor, the hardiness of a locally adapted persimmon, but the fruit you get to eat is, you know, this, this Asian one. You've probably seen apple trees being sold at the nurseries where there's like four different apples on one tree. 
this is, that, that's grafting right there. Um, so anyways, I'm kind of, again, going on a tangent, but the native persimmon is really nice uh, because at the end of the season is when the fruit is ready. We're talking October, November, December, and those fruit will just hang out there sometimes all winter long. And that's great um, late season, winter season food for a lot of wildlife. Um, so it's really important. Um, it gets very tall. I rode a hundred feet and you know, I was just telling you, you know, in the city, you're probably not gonna want something big, but it's very narrow and um, it takes time to grow and, and you can, you know, keep it to a smaller size. Uh, let's see, service berry, June berry. That's a very popular one. That's one that a lot more farmers in this country are going back to. There's been a lot of issues with blueberries and certain diseases and June berries were way more prolific. So the flavor is comparable. I really like June berries. Um, some people would still say blueberries are better and blueberry is native, uh, but June berry is extremely low maintenance um, and provides lots of fruit. But you can, right now, you know, I think we're finishing a harvest of June berries on the farm. You can get varieties that have been cultivated to be compact and heavy fruiting but the wild ones are all over the place they're easy to get a hold of um eastern red bud that's a really popular one i mean you, you've seen red buds uh probably all over the place that one provides a lot of benefits to the local wildlife for most of the year um we've got flowering dogwood I'm gonna move on because I have a feeling, let me check the time. Yeah, it's already 6.30. So Patricia, can you just go to the next slide? I'm sorry for an hour, you know, there's, I can't get too in depth with some of this stuff, but I hope you have lots of questions. You send me, I'm happy to answer questions after the presentation. Um, so here's some more, a mix of uh, edibles and non-edibles. A lot of these we grow on our farm. We have an extensive native orchard. So we have dozens of like cultivars of elderberry um, because, you know, right now elderberry is like one of those new superfoods, right? Like kale was a few years ago. And it's very powerful medicine when it comes to cold and flu season. What a lot of people don't know is that American elderberry is way more potent as a medicine than European elderberry but 90%, if not more, of elderberry products in this country come from the European elderberry because the um, scene of farmers in this country growing elderberry for commercial production is very small. So if anyone out there is thinking about, you know, getting into farming or has a farm, that's a big niche that really still hasn't been um, opened up yet. Uh, but this is a very low maintenance plant. Uh, it, get, it can get very, big and bushy and it spreads underground very easily. So I love it because it's very low maintenance. The flowers attract tons of insects. Um, the fruit's amazing. Don't eat it raw though. You, you can learn all about like, you know, cooking it down because there is some poisonous uh, aspects to these berries before it's ready to be used for consumption. But People have often complained to me that I've landscaped for that, you know, they got excited, they planted an elderberry, it's like really cool, it's an edible, it's medicine, and then it just took over. Um, so be careful when if you decide to go into the elderberry route. You can cut these things to the ground. We do that every winter. A lot of commercial growers actually cut it all the way back, and it promotes a more vigorous plant the next year, which, you know, throws a lot of people off. Um, so it's, you can manage it, but you have to manage it. Um, otherwise it can take over. Next to that is a picture of a um, American hazelnut or filbert. We grow lots of those. Um, they're also very low maintenance. They're, they're very hardy. They're well adapted as long as they're just not waterlogged. Um, I don't, I mulch it once a year. I don't really do anything else. Um, and once, they get going, they can be very prolific. They can yield quite a bit of hazelnuts for you. Another crop that 
is ripe for the um, growing as far as you know commercial production in this country. Um, we've got arrowwood and and spice bush um, and pawpaw. I think I need to move on, but those are really popular. Pawpaw is you know another one of those trending uh, hashtags right now, right in the plant world. Um, if you look up Peterson pawpaws, that guy has spent a long time finding pawpaw um, strains that have really good flavor, have a lot of fruit, you know, meat, quote unquote, and little seed. So if you if you go harvesting, you know, wild pawpaws in the Potomac or something, have fun. It's gonna be great. Um, but a lot of people are like a little disappointed. Um, and you can find through this fella, I mean, lots of nurseries now, edible landscaping, but a lot of them get it through Peterson. And you can get a really strong food crop out of, out of the pawpaws. But anyways, we'll move on. I'm really good at tangents. Um, okay, so, so here's some shrubs. These are beautiful shrubs. Um, we're gonna move on though, just because there's a lot more. We're still on trees and shrubs, but um, those are all low hanging fruit to say. Uh, the sweet spire, summer sweet, beauty berry. Beauty berry is edible if you're into that. Um, and these are, I think, the last few. So Baptisia is a, is a gorgeous, um, really low maintenance, hardy um, plant right here. There's an indigo one, there's a white one, there's a yellow flowering one. Uh, again, it's, one of, it's a classic plant that that first year or two, you're like, what, what is this uh, little plant in my yard? And then once it gets going, it really takes off. I like it a lot because I use it as a farmer to be a really strong companion plant because it's a legume. Um, it's from the Fabache family. So it's a pea family plant. What does that mean? That means that um, beans and baptisia and black locusts, um, are all these plants that have a relationship to a certain bacteria in the soil that can help pull free nitrogen from the atmosphere um, to create, you know, these, these bean pods, basically. And, you know, nitrogen makes amino acids and that makes protein, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but I interplant a lot of these because they, you know, are feeding the soil. It's, not, it's free fertilizer, free nitrogen for the orchards on the farm and will help a lot with your own native gardens. And then rose mallow is this gorgeous native hibiscus plant that I'm starting to see more and more locally at the nurseries. Uh, it really loves wet sites. If you go kayaking or something around this area, you'll see them just sitting in water growing out. Um, it's beautiful. It's low maintenance as long as you give it adequate moisture. Um, all right, we'll move on because time is going. Okay, so these are a lot more of the uh, smaller plants that, you know, people are trying to exchange on Facebook groups and next door and all that. Um, native plant sales. You've got a whole gambit here of ones that if, if you're familiar with, you know, local native plants, all these I'm sure will be very familiar to you. Um, so I'll just give a few quick notes on, on some of these plants. So tick seed, uh, Coreopsis, there's many different ones. If you want to be a purist and, and go the native Coreopsis route, then Coreopsis uh, Zagreb, I don't know how you pronounce this Latin, but that's technically the one that is the native uh, tick seed around here. It's a great low maintenance plant, but it's, it really spreads um, and self seeds and moves underground easily. It's a good filler with a light touch of the thrill. Um, and it just has to be managed. That's all it's, it's you know, I'm not talking about uh, Bermuda grass or morning glory, which is like, you're just trying to stay on top of it, but you do have to watch this tixie kind of creeps up on you. And same with black eyed Susan which is a Rudbeckia family plant. And there are many Rudbeckias that are native to the area. Black-eyed Susan, you know, state flower of Maryland, uh, 
the easy one. You know, it's kind of like Kleenex to tissue paper. Everyone knows Black Eyed Susan. Uh, but there are tons of Rebeccas I encourage you to look up out there that are so gorgeous, just as much as the Black Eyed Susan. And this is another one that will creep in on you um, because if you let those flowers drop seed, you don't deadhead them, the next season or two, all of a sudden, all you see is Black Eyed Susan's um, greening on, on the garden floor. And that might be all right. Uh, but let, plenty of people I worked with are like, oh my gosh, you know, I just grew my own weeds. Um, so they're very, you know, hardy and somewhat aggressive and, and they're easy uh, and they're easy to manage. I mean, it doesn't take too much to just knock back a big stand of them. Uh, we got Eastern Columbine. That's a gorgeous one. That's more of a cool season. So in, you know, mid to late spring, you'll be seeing that. Um, this is one of those plants, like I said earlier, with understanding your site, it loves sun, but it does not like too much heat. So if you can find a spot where in the afternoon it's getting some shade, it'll be that much more happier. Um, the leaves will keep, you know, greening all year, but they can look kind of rough if they're really, you know, if right now, uh, like four or six o'clock, the sun's still beaming down on them. They don't like that. There's a picture of the, the, the bloom to the right of the whole plant. It's an amazing plant. I was telling Patricia that I wish we could do this at, at my farm or in some you know local botanical garden because these pictures don't do justice just how beautiful some of these plants are. All right, we'll move on. Okay, so the, with the monarchs right there, that's goldenrod, which gets a bad rap because it's uh, very prolific at the end of the summer and wrongly gets blamed for a lot of allergies like hay fever. Um, but this is a very important plant because again, like at that time of year, there's not a whole lot, especially, you know, in our landscapes, we're doing non-native plantings. There's not much food out there, especially, you know, monarchs right now are kind of the um, celebrity uh, insects right now, to, so to speak. And that long trip they're trying to make down south, uh, goldenrod, as much as milkweed, um, is, is really important to provide that kind of food on their trip to help fatten them up uh, and, and have something to feed off of while, you know, they're down south, the end of their journey. Um, Butterfly weed is the next one to that. That's another one that that first year you put that little but butterfly weed in there and, and you're like, you know, this is it. This is what everyone's been like making a big fuss about. But once it gets established, um, man, you get so many amazing blooms. That orange right there, you really can't um, uh, capture like how brilliant those flowers are. But this is one of those plants that you're like, yeah, it's, butterflies in the word it's great for butterflies but lots of native bees and other insects um, really benefit from having butterfly weed this is definitely uh, a really important one in the landscape you got joe pie weed next to that uh, joe pie weed there are many cultivars of it because if you let you know a, a, a regular plant all joe pie or sweet joe pie weed go those things can get taller than me um they get huge um they can really take over so you got like little joe now and other cultivars that are more compact and, and easier to work with um that's definitely one that i've been seeing a lot more at the nurseries i think like patuxent nursery had like a half dozen at least different varieties this spring of joe pie weed um all right new york iron weed we'll, we'll keep moving on with the slides uh there's a picture of new york iron weed at the top right again this picture you know really doesn't do it justice then you've got next to that on the right and below monarda um which grows like mint but it, and people will say like oh it's a mint plant but it's actually like a, a different family of plants that's another great one for providing lots of nectar for a lot of local insects if you get a stand going it's it's pretty low maintenance once you get it going and it's beautiful and you'll see tons of stuff just buzzing around it all right we'll move on it is six 
40. All right, we got to go. Um, okay, so Mountain Mint is, um, sorry, Mountain Mint is the one that I meant to say is not a true mint. Um, I don't know why they call it Mountain Mint, but I guess because it does establish itself um, pretty well and, and it spreads. Um, and once you get it going, you really don't have to do a whole lot to it. You don't have to water it. Um, it just, yeah, it's very hardy. And like the Monarda, the bee balm we saw right before, it supports lots of different insects, generalist species that feed on a lot of different plants and also um, specialists is what they call them. Certain insects really only like a few specific plants. Um, so mountain mint is a great all around winner uh, when it comes to native plants. And you've got fire pink. I mentioned that earlier. That one's, I don't see that one a whole lot being sold. Um, it's really diminutive. It's small. Um, it, it gets like a foot or two tall and it's really, you know, thin. But once it blooms, man, you can spot that bloom from across your yard. It really packs the punch. And that specific plant also supports a lot of insects that don't have a whole lot of other options in the landscape. Um, it is a short-lived perennial. Some of these plants, I didn't get to get too much into detail, but are called short-lived perennials. So they may grow a year or two, but eventually they kind of, um, you know, they're spent, but by that point they've self-seeded themselves. Um, and, and we'll just keep growing. Um, Black Eyed Susan is kind of like that. A lot of Rebecca's are like that. Uh, next to the fire pink uh, and above it is a native iris. It's, it's also very small compared to, you know, the big irises they sell at the, at the big box stores. Um, this one's very low maintenance. It loves water. Some of these I wrote moist and well-drained. They just don't want wet feet, but they would like adequate moisture. Um, they're great with lots of mulching on the edges of, of woodland sites. Uh, we'll keep going. Okay, so um, you have this plant that most people either call Culver's root or Veronica, but the Latin name is Ver Veronica strum. And I'm sure I didn't pronounce that right. But I put a picture in the middle uh, because a basic picture of it's the left, you know, you, you see like, okay, there's some white on top of like a bunch of green, like, so what? Uh, a lot of plants look kind of boring like that, but you can see on this picture, um, the racemes of blooms going on it. I, I don't know, I do think it's a really beautiful plant, um, but it's pretty uh, flexible. You know, we're gonna get into shade loving plants, but this is one of those plants that actually could, you know, um, straddle sun and shade in the garden. Um, it's pretty, it's very low maintenance um, once you get it established. Same with golden ragwort. You know, that's a plant that if you ask like on a social media group, like, you know, who has golden ragwort? I'm sure lots of people who bought some are like, I have more than enough to share. Um, a lot of plants are like that on, on, on here. Um, so that's low maintenance. It's a great ground cover. And it puts these like funny still flowers straight up on top. Uh, if you got swamp milkweed, there are many milkweeds actually. Uh, I just put swamp milkweed in case, you know, you're someone who has a very wet site. So rose mallow, swamp milkweed. Um, I have a fern in the presentation. Some people are like, Christian, I'm at the bottom of the hill in my neighborhood or my neighbors, you know, I always get their water on my site. Like it just never is gonna be well draining. So there are options like Joe Pieweed, Swamp Milkweed, Rose Mallow, where, you know, they, they can take some inundation with water. Uh, all right, we'll move on. Oh man, 645. All right. So I think I'm just going to say we'll fast forward. But this slide had um, 
you know, a few plants at the top that we had already mentioned, the tick seed, the golden ragwort, the columbine. Um, again, like some of these plants do just fine in the shade. They may not bloom as much or they may not get as big, but they can totally tolerate some shade. Other plants definitely want a lot of sun, like, like goldenrod or something. Um, so coral bells, uh, that, that one is pretty easy to find at the nurseries. Um, you've got other ones like foam flower and, and this native geranium that are catching up more and more. Some of these plants are deer and rabbit resistant. A lot of them are uh, deer and rabbit tolerant. So they may get nibbled on um, like, a, let's say like a Christmas fern or something, but they can, they can deal with the stress of you know, being munched on. Uh, all right, we'll move on. I'm sorry that this, uh, my presentation <laughs> is uh, maybe a little too much for this one hour. Um, you've got, you know, a few more here to choose from. I, I'll point out wild ginger. A lot of people are like, Christian, you know, I want a ground cover to fill in, you know, and I don't want violets. I'm sick of violets. Violets, I think, are cool. They're native. So wild ginger. Is going to be one of those plants that for a year or two you're like are you doing anything but once it gets going um it really fills in it's it's a beautiful plant i didn't put a picture of the flower but it has a really wild looking flower that occasionally you can get on it um the um virginia bluebells at the bottom there's a picture of a big stand in a forest and what they look like up close that's another really popular ground cover that that indigo blue is incredible if you can ever see it um, for yourself in person. Uh, so I'm sorry, but we're going to move on. So I, you know, I put a, a little slide about grasses and ferns. Um, you know, they, I mean, in their own right, they can be a thriller. As you can see here, you've got uh, pink moly grass to the right. A lot of grasses like the switchgrass and the sea oats um, and the, even the wild rye, as the seasons change, they change in, in, in their color and their appearance. So they're fun. Um, but, you know, like oftentimes you'll see a lot of people, they'll see the fire pink, they'll see the black eyed Susan bloom, they'll see the bluebells, and the grass is just kind of there in the background as contrast and, and, and a little, um, you know. A bit of an unsung hero. The grasses are very important to the ecology. Uh, they provide a lot of food, especially for you know like larger mammals to munch on. Their root systems are very extensive. I use um, a lot of these to establish you know new pastures, new orchards, um, because they're so hardy. They can take a beating. They can take the climate shock of too much rain or too little rain. Um, and they're, they're great for what's going on underneath the soil. Um, and I'll even, you, you know, I, a lot of farmers use rye as a cover crop in the winter time. And there's this one right here, Virginia wild rye, which is a native rye. It's not cultivated the same. So the, you know, you won't get the same benefits as like uh, certain ryes that farmers use, but you'll still get, you know, the basic benefits out of it. So people are experimenting with, using native plants as cover crops. If you don't know what a cover crop means, if you don't have something to do with a site that you're trying to get food from, um, instead of just letting it be bare and let the rain and the elements do away with it or the weeds, you put something there to cover the soil and improve it until you're ready to use it. All right, we'll move on. Uh, These are just more pictures. You got Northern sea oats in the top right. It kind of looks like Japanese silk grass or like a small bamboo. It's a really peculiar looking plant and it, it loves to reseed and spread around and pulling it out is a little tough, <laughs> uh, but that's a really popular plant around here. It's very hardy. Um, you've got blue stem. Blue stem is, I'm sure a lot of you already know blue stem. That's a, that was one of the most common grasses in this country um, for a long time. Uh, you can get, the big one, the basic blue stem gets huge, but there's tons of cultivars that are a little blue stem. A lot of these plants, I'll say real quick, 
they've cultivated, they've hybridized um, to make maybe like more colors available or to make more compact dwarf varieties. Um, but typically, generally speaking, the non cultivars, the ones that you know people aren't breeding for specific traits are the more beneficial ones to the local ecology. So if that's your goal, you know, I would go with something that it was locally um, propagated. They, they often call those ecotypes. Um, and you get from a nursery, they were authorized or just went out on their own property or a national park and harvested seed or cuttings. And that would be like an ecotype rather than someone intentionally on like a plot of land breeding and breeding. There's a place for both, um, but that, you know, the ecology benefits from those ecotypes. All right, we'll move on. Um, okay, so uh, real quick, this is a picture of someone who does more like what I do, a mix of natives and non-natives. Uh, so this is like a vegetable garden, but you see there's a nice big um, little uh, oasis of native plants in the middle and other things. So we'll move on to the next slide. I just put a sampling. If you're someone who wants to, you know, add to your oasis more than just native plants, um, but support still the local ecology. These are just a few either plant families, um, like in the middle, you know, you have this one family called, I don't know how to pronounce it, apiache or something, but there's a lot of familiar plants in there like dill and carrot and parsnip and lovage and, and what have you. Um, I use those plants a lot for pest control. A lot of these flowers are edible. Anyways, it's just a sampling. This is like something I put more in like my pest and disease control gardening vegetable classes. Um, but you don't, you know, have to just do natives, um, even though we're emphasizing them. Uh, all right, we'll move on because of time. This is just a basic cheat sheet. If you want to have blooms all year round, um, I think most of these plants were in the presentation, maybe not like witch hazel and um, coral honeysuckle. But um, if, you know, if your goal is to provide a source of food um, and aesthetic for your garden um, all year round, there are many more that can be added to this. I'm sure you could probably find some native plants website that has this all laid out. But I put in, just from my experience of growing these plants, you know, what um, blooming times there are. So uh, there's that and we'll keep going. Okay, so, you know, again, like if you, if you, I, I have one person I worked with, they spent thousands of dollars on native plants and just put so many in, dozens and dozens. And three years later, only maybe like, 20% of those plants are still there and established. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that, but start small. Like, you know, you know, you don't have to just transform everything overnight. And, you know, I put compound interest in there because like, you know, those little investments add up. Um, plants, I mean, if you've seen in your own garden, you get two leaves, three leaves, it's growing slow. Then the heat picks up, the sunlight, there's more hours in the day, there's more leaves on the plant, there's more solar panels, and then it starts growing faster and faster because it just has exponentially more and more um, support behind it. So, uh, you know, just a quick note, you don't have to uh, go crazy and, you know, have it all 100%, you know, native plants and, and get rid of all your lawn the first year, first day or whatever. Clumps is really helpful. That was one of the problems with that site, that garden project. They just wanted a little bit of everything and they didn't do a lot of a few things, which is what I would have done. I've seen in my experience, and it could be different for you, that clumping like groups of, of these plants will help them support each other. And, and if you're gonna lose a few, it's insurance that some will survive. Um, and you'll be able to see them when maybe the weeds get out of control or other native plants that are more aggressive start taking over. Um, so I highly recommend doing clumps and, and groupings. Uh, I would 
not if it says drought tolerant that doesn't necessarily mean that first year or even two or three years that you can just set it and forget it you got to provide moisture um, the best time of year to plant perennials generally speaking is fall which sounds funny because the spring rush you know when everyone's got their seed catalogs and the nurseries and the home depots are selling and you're feeling ready for winter to be over uh, that's fine you can plant these plants in the spring in the summer even but the you know perennials really do well when they're planted in the win uh, fall or winter because their roots will keep growing um, and that's really what's going to support and establish those plants to provide you know lots on top of the ground later um, and 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 going back to irrigation you know you have to provide either good mulching or drip irrigation or or just be on top of it um, infrequent deep waterings generally are more preferred across the board for plants than a lot of like quick sprinkles you know like waking up going out for five minutes hosing everything down and then doing it to get again the next day um top dressing and mulch we said mulching top dressing you know a lot of these plants are pretty low maintenance you don't have to fertilize them in the way you would vegetables um but the soil test may clue you in to some deficiencies so you know don't completely say like well they're native plants they'll do well in any soil your soil specifically might actually need a little bit of a boost and i the first year will probably add at some point a top dress they'll call it or a side dress whatever uh maybe some like nice compost as the year goes on as they've been feeding and growing just to give them a little support. And then I just put a few amendments that I use a lot in uh, vegetable and orchard farming, but they both are what you could say like low octane, like not intense fertilizers that your plants will definitely benefit from. So alf alfalfa meal is like a source of nitrogen, but it's slow release. It's great for the soil because it has tons of minerals. Alfalfa roots go so deep. And I always put alfalfa meal on everything. Um, Essential Plus is this basically like compost extract, um, but it's not like a run of the mill extract you can make in your backyard. It's, it's got these certain acids, humic acid, fulvic acid, whatever. But to just tell you how strong this stuff is, we had a nursery across the street from the farm five years ago go out of business they sold the land to like a developer now everything is like starting in the 900s and up kind of thing um it's the story of you know farming in suburbia right now hey christian and, yeah. sorry to interrupt we've only got a couple of minutes left um oh, do you shoot. want to <laughs> uh skip ahead or what do you yeah want we to can do? skip ahead i'm sorry you know if anyone wants to just email me later i'm happy to talk more i'm sorry again about how uh, little i was able to throw in Oh, no, you're good. You threw in a lot. But um, I, I want to make sure we have like a couple of. Yeah, minutes. yeah, that's OK. Should I just skip to the end or do you want to talk about the slide? The, oh, sorry. This is the end. This is the last slide. It's just stuff for people to um, hang out with. You know, if you want to learn more, the Native Plant Center at the top, they're famous for putting out this booklet. I should have brought it in the room with me. But it's like the Bible for, you know, native plants in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. I don't know if they still print it, um, but you can get a PDF of it online. But they, everything has been digitized, so you can just use their website, Fish and Wildlife Service. And then there's some, you know, other websites there. But anyways, yeah, sorry. That's the last slide. That's it. We can just do questions or discussion. All right, uh, let me pull up the chat box. Uh, are you guys okay with us staying just an extra five minutes for questions? All right, so let me go to the to the questions. Yes, yeah, fine. Cool, thanks everybody. Um, so Christian, folks asked if the slides were, would be available later and I said I'd share them. I hope that's okay with you. Totally, yeah. yeah. Uh, Greg asked, where can we find some of these plants such as rose mallow? Okay, that's a good question. 
So we have a small native plant nursery to plug ourselves, and I'd love to give you a tour. But but more seriously speaking, I believe that last uh, on the last slide, uh, the woman she's I believe she's from Northern Virginia. She's all about native plants, and I'm pretty sure she has a very extensive list on our website of native plant sales and nurseries that supply native plants. Um, so I would check that out. And then um, a lot of the people I work with on the side um, are on Facebook native plant groups. So there's like a Silver Spring native plant group. There's a Maryland Native Plant Society. Um, that's a great way to get free plants. You can trade or people are like, just, just take it. You know, I, I mean, some of these plants eventually you have more than enough to share. So I would start there. Uh, if you want rose mallow, we have a lot. I'm waiting. I like to, you know, get the plants pretty big before selling them. Um, so if you came like later this summer or just email me and I, and I can get you some rose mallow, but, uh, yeah. Well, cool. thank you. Um, another yeah. question is, uh, what are some other smaller companion plants to help nourish the soil? Okay, I get. I wonder if that was inspired by the baptisia. Um, so, I I mean, all right. I singled out the baptisia and and in generally speaking, like leguminous plants because specifically they're putting nitrogen in the soil. A lot of people I've, I've seen, you know, they'll say like marigolds go with tomatoes or basil goes with this, or there's all these like pairs, these pairings, companion plants. And for me, I have a different take where honestly, like the more diversity of plants in the garden, the better. I don't necessarily get into specifics unless it has to do with, again, that, that nitrogen providing plant family. Um, because that's really important um, in the soil. It can get expensive to buy even organic sources of nitrogen. So I'll, I don't know if that answers the question, but in, in general, like more diversity of plants are my companions. But for the specific thing, especially because I'm a commercial grower and I don't want to buy, you know, poultry litter or so much alfalfa meal. And then there's the labor of applying all that fertilizer. I really use um, these cover plants, these cover crops, like the Baptisia, which is native, to um, kind of do that work for me. So I hope that answers your question, but if not, maybe we can talk more later. Cool, thanks. So um, from Olivia, I like to leave the seeds of black-eyed Susans for the finches. My patch has grown though. So what is the best way to manage the growth <laughs> and make sure they aren't too crowded? Yeah, that's a perennial problem uh, is finding that balance. Um, I, yeah, yeah, it's tough. And, and especially because some people don't want, they don't like the aesthetic of things over the winter sitting out, right? Like all these skeletons of what used to be in your garden. Um, but I, I mean, it sounds like uh, there's more than enough to go around. So I, I mean, I would just hack it back to whatever you want. Um, I think the more important thing is if we can get more people to, you know, grow things for the goldfinches like black eyed Susans or echinacea, which is not native, but, you know, still provides food. Then we'll just have in general more food. And then you, you're not bearing the brunt, right? Of having the whole garden be the goldfinch seed. If you, if you want to, yeah, you kind of just have to, decide how much you want to leave right uh, but not let it take over because it sounds like it has been so I don't know again if that's a very helpful answer but <laughs> it shouldn't all be on you thanks um just a couple more so the first is will any, will, would any of these native plants or bushes repel rodents repel rodents that's a really good question I've heard native and non-native plants be cited as repelling, um, having repelling properties. Unfortunately, I've, I've never once had success myself with trying them. So I can't with a straight face tell you what would be a good plant. I mean, like daffodils is like a really common permaculture plant for placing around young fruit trees. 
um, because it's supposed to repel that and like garlic. It's supposed to repel rodents, like voles that would nibble on your young fruit trees. But I've seen that disproven. So I can't tell you <laughs> what um, smelling plants would help with, with that. Just a follow-up question. How about rabbit repelling? Anything? <laughs> yeah, rabbit. So um, I can tell you what I use to repel. Again, I don't know any plants that, you know, I've, I mean, and, and now I'm guilty because in the presentation I wrote deer, you know, resistant. I've seen deer eat things that were, you know, supposedly uh, not attractive to deer. So I don't know what exactly is going to work for deer and rabbits. But what I do, what a lot of farmers do, is we'll use blood meal. And I know that sounds kind of weird and gross and it stinks, but we'll we'll buy, I buy a product called plant skid. It's, I think it's like a Swedish product. They coat vegetable oil on this dried blood and you spray it. And the vegetable oil helps to keep it rainproof for many weeks. Most farmers just put plain old blood meal, but if it rains, forget it. And that smell is very unattractive to bulls, rabbits, deer, um, groundhogs. So personally, that's what I do. I don't, some of the guys on the farm, they trap rodents. I'm like, you know, I think it's a waste of time because there's an unlimited amount of them out there. And, but that blood meal stuff works so well for me. Other people will tell you to use Irish spring soap. Try everything out, but you know, that's the only thing that's worked for me. All right, cool. Thank you. Last question. Uh, do you use comfrey on the farm? I've read so much about using it in food forests. Yeah, yeah. That's another um, super plant in the permaculture world. Yeah, we have comfrey. We use it. I, sometimes I'll put it in our compost teas. Um, you have to watch out sometimes, kind of like the black eyed Susan, it can kind of take over. Um, but it's, a, it's one of those plants whose roots can really mine the soil like alfalfa. And so in those, excuse me, in the tissues of the plants, when it dies back or you mow it down periodically, you're releasing you know, nutrients, minerals that were way down below that you're not gonna use a tiller or whatever to, to pull out because that's gonna cause more harm than good. So, you know, yeah, a lot of people use that as a cover crop. I don't do too much with comfrey. Um, but it's it's very popular, yeah. And it's low maintenance. It doesn't take more than an inch of a piece of root to re to start new new comfrey plants. It's very easy to propagate. Cool, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Thanks so much for staying behind a couple of minutes, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Christian, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'll share your slides and the presentation with everybody, the recording. Uh, a lot of information there. So that was that was really exciting. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having I'm I'm very sorry. Again. I feel like we just skimmed the surface, but thanks for your patience. It was Come visit great. me on the farm. <laughs> there was actually a conversation in the chat box about people wanting to visit you. So I might follow up with you on that. That would be good. Great. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to stop recording. Okay.